Agent Morris with the NSA. We have identified some very, very interesting anomalous um, type of aircraft. Traffic is quite luminous and is exhibiting some anomalistic motion over. Uh, move very rapidly at any speed or whether any direction it wanted to go. Why it could change and go to the right or the left or go crossways uh, without hesitating a bit. What do you think it was? Well, if they call it a flying saucer, that's what it is. Do you want to report a UFO? Over. Negative. We don't want to report. Look, it wasn't my worst Wednesday night. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another live edition of Anomaly Now, streaming to you live from Austin, Texas, uh, through the interwebs and all across the universe. I'm Smiles Lewis, and this is uh, my good friend and co-host, Mark Jackson. How are you doing, Mark? Hey, good, Miles. Um, thank you for putting this together again. Looking forward to some continued shows, and i got to add, that intro just never gets old. In fact, it keeps getting better. <laughs> well, I'm glad you like it. I, it like, I just threw it together some time ago, uh, and it shows. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you know, like I've, I've said, there's a little bit of a story behind it, uh, I uh, uh, won't go into all the details now, but suffice to say, uh, my friend from many years ago who made the music um, actually had a, a series of UFO sightings when he was young, uh, while he was living at the uh, a seminary in upstate New York, right on the Hudson, very famous flap area, um, a very fascinating uh, a series of sightings, and um, maybe 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 I can coax him on the show some someday to talk about it. But um, we would look forward to that. That'd be absolute, great. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, well, man, uh, I hope you've been doing well. I've I've really uh, had a great weekend. Uh, we're, we got the cooler temperatures, uh, and uh, being here in Texas, it's it's always nice to get a little bit of respite from from the the, the baking of the brain from the uh, solar radiation, but. Um, I also this past weekend uh, had a really great time. I with our inaugural episode last last week, I, I kind of listed off the litany of um, many interesting paranormal and UFO related uh, online streaming conferences. Uh, last this past weekend was uh, Phenomena Con Two, put on by the uh, Newkirks. That's Greg and Dana Newkirk, who folks probably know from their uh, Netflix and YouTube series Hell Year seasons one and two streaming. Of uh, live online now, and uh, the the work that they've done uh, over the last many many years, creating their traveling museum of the paranormal and occult, and uh, the amazing community that they've built uh, th through their efforts and their constant um, uh, creation of media and and just cultivating a really great wonderful community. Um, this was a three day uh, event that they uh, really topped themselves. They they claim to have had over a thousand. Attendees, I know their 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 community is is about that big. Uh, I certainly was seeing numbers of in the in the order of, I think uh, anywhere from four to six plus hundred uh, for each of the presenters. Um, it was a fantastic array of speakers. Um, Dr. Uh, Andrea Kitta uh, was the very first uh, presenter, and she was talking about Slender Man and folklore. Um, there was uh, some 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 live music uh, from Hellier that was performed. Uh, very interesting. Uh, always love seeing musicians, even when they're performing in their homes. I really miss that aspect of uh, the freedoms that we enjoy going out uh, without having to worry about something called COVID. But uh, meanwhile, there was also Doctor Dean Freaking Raiden, the parapsychologist. Somebody yeah. who I always loved. Uh, our local group INAX was uh, lucky enough years ago to have him present locally. And he is just always fascinating because he's a scientist. And even though there are obviously skeptics who still criticize his efforts, um, he seems to really know what he's talking about. And uh, uh, his presentation, like all of these presentations, were just were just phenomenal and for phenomena con. And uh, there, I could just go on and on. But uh, oh, our local our local filmmaker uh, Brad Abrahams, uh, they, they played some of his work, uh, Swan Song of the Skunk Ape. So there was a cryptozoology element. They did hit. They played his cool. conspiracy, conspiracy yeah. cruise, uh, which has to deal with the rep 
reptoid aliens and uh, global conspiracies and and whatnot. Eh, funny look at most of most of uh, if you've seen Brad Abraham stuff like uh, Love and Saucers, you've, you've seen uh, his his take on things. Uh, some other great um, short cinema from uh, this uh, Ron, Ronnie Thomas with the Midnight Archives and uh, the phenomenal Shannon Taggart, who has this amazing seance book with her photography of the spirit spiritualist community uh, just mm-hmm. on and on and on there were just so many fantastic uh, presentations i can't uh, say enough they've really outdone themselves and boy i tell you you know that's a hard bar to try to reach um and uh, you know uh it, it, the, meanwhile coming up this weekend is uh, some good friends of mine the conspiranormal folks uh, adam sane and company who are putting on a three-day event and this is their second time uh putting on a conference uh, this is the strange realities conference a ticket's still available um, both of these events, very modestly priced, uh, amazingly cheap, uh, by comparison to the kind of thing that you would normally spend if you were having to go to, um, uh, you know, to go somewhere and spend it on a hotel and the food and the travel. Uh, that is one of the big advantages. I will, I do want to very quickly set aside a piece of factual information or misinformation. The new Kirks with their promotion of the phenomena con constantly refer to it as the first ever paranormal online conference i'm sorry folks that is not true uh it was about 10 years ago the one the first i was aware of i had several friends who participated as lecturers it wasn't near as well done uh or near as a uh, 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 sprawling of an event but uh you know there's a lot of time that's passed and and they've really honed their craft and um and the internet's a, a lot different now but again strange realities 2 is coming up and uh, some good friends of ours are going to be uh, presenting there, uh, Greg Bishop and Joshua Cutchin and others, um, just phenomenal la- lineup. You can you can find the links online. Miles, do you know um, the uh, Phenomicon? Is that if we didn't attend and we want to go back and try to view it or sort of attend in, you know, is that possible for any of us out here? No. And okay. that is one of the big differences here. Um, I have no, I, I know that they have their own archives. And the, the irony here is that they, they call themselves a museum, which, um, you know, they they do collect objects. They and they preserve them, and they you know, educate the public about them. And it's a traveling museum. Um, I don't think they have a physical location where you can go visit these things. But yes, I mean, I know that they've got the recordings. Um, but they basically the way they handle it is uh, it's it's they keep it up for about 16 hours after the event. This, this was a 37 hour event. Yeah. Each, each day was about yeah. eight hours long. Uh, I think that's the max for the length of the streams allowed by the services they're using. And, um, and so they're not even, so even, even if you wanted to go back and look, you have to kind of wade through, you have to, you know, scan ahead. Uh, but you know, it, it, the thing is they still have all that material and perhaps someday they'll put it out. Um, I, I think it's, it's really fascinating to me to see that how these different groups uh, put, put together such events. We, of course, have been uh, looking into doing a, a big fundraiser, probably of some kind of similar fashion, maybe charged for the event, maybe free. I don't know. Um, you know, the, the Central Texas uh, UFO Jane's um, lock, UFO Lockdown Festival that I mentioned also uh, happened a couple of weeks ago. Um, was it, she her approach is it's completely free. She she streams it through her YouTube channel and and it's it's a, it's a very different kind of uh, approach, but it, it it's perfectly good and and lots of good guests and um and this was the second one that she did. Uh, those are all still free and available. But um okay and and with with strange realities, um interestingly enough, they uh they restreamed. They did record the actual live in-person Strange Realities Conference number one that was uh, last year in Nashville. They restreamed the recordings of that okay. uh, for free, obviously trying to promote uh, this new one and, and drum up uh, uh, sales. And, you know, hey, good on them. Uh, I don't know. I think and I think actually I think that is now available on their YouTube channel for free, the, the first conference. So um, who knows how long that'll last. So go check it out. Right, um, thanks. Yeah, that's good. Well, um, as usual, there are a ton of news stories that we could uh, talk about today. I, um, I know there's there's only a limited amount of time in our nice little 30-minute show here today, but uh, we have gone through our uh, our list of, of, of potential articles, and, um, you know, it's always hard to choose what you're going to talk about in such a small amount of time, but um, I think uh, we've got some interesting stuff to cover here. Oh, is that not showing? I see. That's... There we go. 
So uh, we, uh, as we've said before, we, we post uh, all of our news articles over at our flipboard.com magazine, um, which of course uh, the feed is syndicated over on our website, anomalyarchives.org. We are a 501c3 nonprofit. If you want to find out more about uh, our activities and what we're all about, you can go to anomalyarchives.org. And uh, some of the things that we were uh, th- thinking about talking about, did you, why don't we lead with uh, the one that you uh, were focused on? Because that, that's a fascinating subject. Uh, here it is. Are satellites tracking UFOs? Right. And uh, um, this, uh, I, I don't know this fellow particularly well or personally, uh, but uh, the the fellow is his last name Silva. I forget. Uh, but he has this SilvaRecord.com uh, website, and um, it's where he uh, does a lot of uh, his reporting. And there is this current article from a few days ago. Are satellites tracking UFOs? What do you think? Are they? Well, (laughs) yes. The bottom line is yes. And I'll tell you why is because we're going to talk about the sensors that these satellites have on them. So this is a little bit of a crossover between the tech and then a little bit of politics as well. But the key phrase with this particular article, by the way, the article is great. Everybody should go to the Flipboard Read this thing. I mean, there's just so much to unpack here. Uh, And thank you, by the way, for posting this uh, very important article. So the key term here is phenomenology. Okay, so that's really the takeaway from this article. And if if folks out there that are tracking some of this stuff, um, phenomenology is a term that's regularly now being pushed around by the ATIP folks and Eric Davis, for example, from Earth Tech, et cetera. So phenomenology, what is that? All right, so when you put it in the context of satellites trying to track Um, Unidentified Aerial Phenomena, or UAPs, phenomenology is the um, reaction of any object to electromagnetic spectrum, or what we would call light. And as we all know that there's light that falls um, within the visible range, and then, you know, you have ultraviolet on one end that you can't see, and then you have infrared on the other. So what was really cool, yeah, there we go, phenomenology, great. So again, phenomenology is just the data that you can glean from an object in the presence of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so the article kind of starts out with some radar conversation, you know, narrative about how NORAD had tracked um, radar signatures and how they're cataloged and filed. But what's really interesting today is we have the same sensor sets on the uh, jets that are flying around and also the, the air uh, the naval vessels uh, Mm -hmm. or ships as we have on the satellites. And so what's happened is radar has been kind of for years getting phased out. And the difference between radar and these new sensor systems is instead of using an antenna, you're now using mirrors, um, uh, mirrors and cameras essentially. Okay. So what's really cool about this is that we are cataloging with these new sensors, all kinds of flight profiles, but more specifically, the phenomenology or the electromagnetic signature that these sensors pick up. So when we think about things like the Nimitz encounter, that was a forward-looking infrared um, system, which technically falls under uh, a sensor type or sensor family known as electro-optical IR, so electro-optical infrared. This is really cool, Miles, because what happens is when this data is collected, it gets these very specific spectral signatures. All right. And then, like, for example, with the FLIR footage, you have an algorithm then that discriminates the background from the target based on the phenomenological data it senses or the electromagnetic signature, basically, that it gives off. OK, why is this really cool? Because we've been tracking this stuff for so long and we have such a backlog of this, um, these data profiles or these electromagnetic profiles, but nobody's gone through them because it takes an act of Congress to fund, you know, somebody to crawl through and kind of um, adjust these algorithms to discriminate for the signatures. Okay, so there, there's two really cool things here. And I'll, I'll try to wrap this up because I, like you said, there's just so much to talk about in a little amount of time. So anyway, um, the Nimitz encounter was really important because that system was an electro-optical infrared system, for, formerly known as the FLIR gimbal system with some tracking technology to it. Okay, that's really awesome because now we're starting to build a profile of what these objects' signatures may look like. And so we can comb through satellite data and look for that same signature. 
Now, who's going to pay for that? Well, <laughs> it turns out that the Intelligence Authorization Act for fiscal year 2021 includes funding to go through and discriminate all these signatures from the satellite data compared against um, airborne or groundborne signatures that we've identified or that the government has identified, not necessarily us. So they're sitting on a pile of data and the funding to use these algorithms to discriminate these signatures is coming out in 2021, fiscal year 2021. Okay, what's really cool about that is once you discriminate that signature, now you can start scanning the skies, or in this case, terrestrial, if you're a satellite you know, asset, now you can start scanning for that, that specific signature, which will tell you it's not a satellite, it's not a rocket, it's not a spaceship, it's not an airplane, et cetera. It's the other category. <laughs> so anyway, we get to not only go back and look at all the signatures from electro-optical um, you know, satellite data previously, but in moving forward now, we have a signature to look for to discriminate from all other aerial phenomena. Yeah, man. I highly suggest everybody go read it. It's a little technical, but if you take your time, uh, you'll understand sensors and how we can start better identifying unidentified flying objects. And it, get, it gets to the crux of, of uh, you know, it reminds me again of Austin's own UFO history with Ray Stanford and PSI, Project Starlight International, where he had uh, he was trying to do instrumented ufology. He had yeah. radars, lasers magnetometers and i believe i don't think he was the first but you know remember they used to sell ufo detectors in magazines and and most often they were just basically something a little alarm that would trip if there was a a significant shift in the magnetic field in your area and mm -hmm. it just that gets to the that's just the obviously the just the barest of this kind of a thing or just ways to detect the energy associated with this. And I think uh, if it wasn't Ray, it was somebody else who who uh, suggested that that uh, a lot of UFO sightings seem to uh, have a correlation with um, uh, ELF, extremely low frequency uh, uh, electromagnetic energy or, or energy. Yeah, I'm I'm not the best person to talk about this, <laughs> but uh, uh, other than I, I've always been fascinated by all the weird conjunctions of ELF in the UFO and paranormal ar arenas. Yeah. But there's so many great leads in there because uh, it mentions all these things that I hadn't thought about in a long time, like uh, uh, former MUFON director uh, John Schusler's uh, uh, paper on using different technologies to, to detect UFOs. Um, I remember there was a, a plan to use, I think it's called MADAR, some kind of variation on radar. And and I'll never forget, and I can't, I will, I won't say who it is because I, I may be misremembering, but I know a certain person who was high up in MUFON who once told me, this is probably six years ago, and they would have, they would know because they, I believe, had interactions with him that Bigelow, you know, here's Bigelow Aerospace making, uh, uh, space bubble hotels or whatever, but I think right. he also makes satellites. Hmm. Mm. I think he might have access to some of this kind of data of his own. I wonder. I think he also builds algorithms. So you talk about a fiscal year coming up in 2021 where, you know, the um, Ways and Means Committee, the various intelligence chairs and boards, et cetera, somebody's going to get a really big contract to build an algorithm to go back through and data mine all of this electro optical data that they've been collecting with these satellites basically over the last 20 years, or maybe even before that it turns out these sensors, which, Oh, by the way, are very commonly used now in agriculture because they use the spectral signatures of phenological aspects of plants to uh, derive um, crop yield and crop uh, veracity, et cetera. In other words, um, pounds per acre sort of stuff. But anyway, mm -hmm. the bottom line is they're very common. So now that these, this really, really incredible technology is very common, you have to ask yourself, when, when was this really made? <laughs> You're right. If farmers are using it on their crop dusters to evaluate their crops and crop health, et cetera, pretty sure this is going back more than 20 years. Yeah. Um, and I would bet you money that the intelligence community uh, in connection with the military has been using this for exactly the agricultural aspect of this. Like, what's this country's, you know, uh, ability to to supply food for its troops and that sort of thing and just predicting unrest based on food shortages and that sort of thing. I mean, there's obviously yeah. a lot of interconnected potentials here, but instrumentation is 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 key if you're trying going to try to do a scientific investigation of, of these phenomena. and. Um, and, and like you were saying, they're also now on the, the, the uh, military hardware, not just the stuff in orbit, but 
planes, trains, and automobiles and oh. air, you know. Uh, street lights. I don't know. I mean, how far do you want to take this? Ooh. I mean, there's uh, th these are so small you can fit them on a drone with a very limited payload, right? So we use them in, a, in the industry I work in. That's why I gravitated towards the story because I use electro optical uh, s sensors for a variety of things, including crop analysis and environmental initiatives. Okay, what's really important here is that um, this technology what is as big of a leap forward as radar was when it came out. In fact, electro-optical IR sensors were up until a number of years ago, about 2010, was the most highly classified, one of the most highly classified technologies in the US government. It was that superior to everything else. Yeah. It's funny what we can do with a, with a little bit of rare earth elements and a couple of mirrors, huh? Yes, indeed, indeed. <laughs> uh, well, um, let's pivot here to some of the other articles. Again, there's there are a ton of articles. I think there's over six thousand stories here in our uh, our anomaly archives Flipboard, um, and there was a couple of different ones that I wanted to, to comment on. This one here: mobile phone radiation may be killing insects, which says a German study. This is from Phys.org, Phys.org, P uh, P H Y S dot org, a more uh, traditional uh, science site. This isn't necessarily you know uh, uh, just some crank. Uh, <laughs> crank a pseudoscience right. website right. um the now the particular study they're talking about has yet to be peer-reviewed so but it says it's an analysis of 190 scientific studies carried out by germany's nature and biodiversity conservation union nabu uh, together yeah. with two ngos one from germany and one from luxembourg um and it's, surprise surprise it, it it seems to that they seem to have found data uh, that the Wi-Fi radiation, mobile phone radiation in particular, opens the calcium channels in certain cells, meaning they absorb more calcium ions, and this can trigger a biochemical chain reaction in insects, disrupting circadian rhythms and the immune system. Now, obviously, there are a lot of uh, uh, very scary-sounding um, conspiracy theories surrounding uh, the, the rollout of 5G and other technologies. Obviously, anytime anything new comes out, people are rightfully going to be concerned and we certainly have enough uh, evidence uh, from other studies over the years uh, that there are potential things to be concerned about. And of course, the final, you know, uh, one of the more important aspects of this article is, of course, them saying that it's not just about how it's affecting insects, though obviously, th them insects is an important part of uh, our, our planet's ecosystem that's uh, integral to the to the ecology that we have. But it has implications for, for potential human uh, effects on both animals and humans. Of course, animal, humans are animals. So um, uh, you, this isn't a very in-depth article, but it does have links to the, the research and uh, you can f find out more about it. And I'm, I hope that we hear more about this. But I do tend to be a little more conspiratorial when it comes to the probability that... Uh, big business can can quash um, any kind of research that tends to 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 be potentially interfering in in their own uh, market segment but uh, that's one of the interesting articles over at our flipboard page that you can check out also right next to it a totally different subject here the philosophy of the flying saucers this is actually from a couple of months ago from the uh, website of I believe uh, a, a local I'm not sure where kcrw.com assume it's a a local uh um, radio station in some part of the country and they've got this podcast called unfictional this came out in april uh, hosted by bob carlson and I, so i don't know most of our listeners might be aware of the shaver mysteries this is uh, part of the early folklore uh, and the formation of the modern myths about UFOs. And there are so many themes run through the Shaver mystery uh, that, that are still with us today that are part of even older occult traditions. Um, but it basically has to do with this idea of something we touched on last episode, the idea of ultra terrestrials or crypto terrestrials, the idea that there could be some other civilization here with us on this planet. In this case, inside the planet, like we also kind of alluded to in the last uh, episode. And uh, this this article intrigues me, not least of which because it involves um, somebody discovering an old reel-to-reel -reel audio tape and uh, going to digitize it and discovering that, oh, it's, you know, their father who uh, uh, was famous for having written a letter to 
the publisher of one of these classic pulp magazines. There's the cover of one of these, the amazing stories. Okay. These are the old, the early sci-fi pulp magazines that, um, you know, really blurred the line between fact and fiction. And there were a lot of people that, that took these things to be mm. true or chose to believe you know, to a, to a degree. Um, there's a lot of really interesting uh, aspects of this, but um, uh, there's an, there's an audio. I, th- I think they have audio of some of these clips, but basically this gentleman uh, wrote into the magazine way back in, I think the forties uh, claiming similar experiences to, to bolster the claims of Richard Shaver, who claimed to have been um, uh, in, in interacting with and tormented by these Darrow, these deleterious robots from the subterranean world who had their, 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 their rays that they would shoot up at us and control politicians and whole populations. And there's so many shades there of, of course, all the inner earth mysteries, this again, crypto terrestrial, uh, aspect, uh, elements of mind control, um, elements of abducting humans, particularly, uh, uh, females, and um, this gentleman wrote in and, and bolstered this this mythos, but then years later, uh, or shortly thereafter, I think, actually fessed up that he totally made up all of this uh, story of his, and I think regretted it for a long time later. But um, fascinating story. Uh, you can uh, go check that out at kcrw.com, The Philosophy of Flying Saucers. Um, another thing that we had on here that I thought I'm, you know, I was born in San Antonio. I consider myself an Austinite because I've been here since kindergarten, but, um, I loved the, the San Antonio zoo. It's been so long since I went and as much uh, as I have mm, different feelings about the nature of zoos in general, uh, you know, I know that at, at, at their best, they are trying to, uh, protect these animals and and educate the public about them, and I think they're get, these kinds of institutions are getting better at it. Well, wouldn't you know? You know, the paranormal is big business and can attract a crowd. So, w- what are they doing? Uh, they're capitalizing on the urban legend uh, known as the chupacabra, except that they. St- like so many others, they misspell it. They don't spell it the correct way. I believe chupacabras is always supposed to have an S, even if you're referring to a singular creature. Um, this is, I believe, just basic uh, grammar, but anyway, uh, or the the, or the 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 basic spelling of the word. But nonetheless, so they've got this this new uh, um, uh, display going on. They don't actually show anything, any pictures of it here that I could find. Um, and though they do show um, another thing, another thing important to San Antonio culture is the uh, the Fiesta Parade. And uh, one of the longstanding traditions is the creation of these little pins, uh, these enamel pins or other types of, of pins. It's kind of like a Mardi Gras thing of, you know, you, you, you collect these these pins for the uh, uh, the celebration um, as a, just a random aside. I I. I don't know if I've ever talked to you about this, Mark, but I am a survivor of, of a mass shooting, and that was the 1979 parade shooting at the Fiesta Battle of the Flowers Parade and a um, whole other topic of discussion. But uh, th- I, I bring that up because I was reminded of uh, a year or two ago, a few years ago, uh, another survivor about my age who's an artist there in San Antonio created his own uh, pen to remember and commemorate the shooting um, and it created quite a stir because it was it well you know it had a skel- a skeleton I think and, and some bullets flying and people thought it may not have been in good taste I thought it was actually pretty nice art and it, what, <clears throat> bottom line it was his way of coming to terms with it and and um, perhaps moving past it but anyway the, so they've got of course yeah. they've got a drink a chupacabra drink uh, alcoholic and non alcoholic so the adults can and have a little more fun than the kids, I guess. Um, but uh, I'll be curious to see uh, what, if anything, comes of this. It's always interesting to me to see uh, mainstream organizations, uh, especially parks and 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 wildlife oriented organizations, take on this sort of uh, uh, you know urban legend, quote unquote, uh, mythology and and so forth. Um, you know, there's so many examples, most of them not particularly good, uh, where sometimes. Uh, I believe it was the Round Rock uh, Parks Department uh, collaborated with a known uh, Bigfoot hoaxer to to promote uh, one of their really cool sounding. It was you know all to get kids out into the wilderness and educate them about the wilderness. Sure. That's, all, that's all good, but when you collaborate with a known hoaxer like that, um, but yeah, so I was pretty uh, uh, excited to see that uh, my hometown zoo is 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 partaking 
of uh, the crypto tourism or para tourism. Uh, I can't wait to have myself one of those drinks. I'm kind yeah. of, I'm, I'm wondering what the mix is there. <laughs> I'm curious <laughs> myself. Oh, and I think yeah. they put, and it's also very much in in, in keeping with a, uh, a a a a spooky time of year. I think they have some like teeth. Sure. Uh, that are, I guess, I'm guessing are probably those cheap plastic teeth that you can put in to look like a vampire. Except now you're, I guess, you have chupa copper teeth. I guess I don't know. Uh, well, good well, on the board uh, to uh, to approve that move. That's really cool. So. Uh, Congrats to the uh, board members there taking a little bit of a risk and uh, <laughs> scratching an itch for the rest of us out here. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Well, it, we are just at the, about the 30-minute uh, mark. And, um, Mark, thank you yeah. so much for joining me. Miles, um, thank you as really always. appreciate it. And uh, we'll be back next week. And uh, we'll also be uh, eventually throwing some uh, – some other content in here with some interviews and so forth. Those may be on different days, but uh, really enjoy uh, doing something brief and uh, on uh, the latest news. And so you can always go to anomalyarchives.org for more information. So we'll see you next week. Excellent, Miles. Thanks, everybody. Good night. <laughs>